Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us for Wild Edition Science 2021. Today, we will catch everyone up to speed on new technology that the Wild Dolphin Project has been implementing and what the future holds for the project. But first, let's go back to the beginning to remind everyone how it all started. Dr. Denise Herzing founded the Wild Dolphin Project in 1985, and her inspiration came from some very well-known women scientists. When I was in graduate school, Jane Goodall was out studying chimpanzees, Diane Fossey was looking at gorillas, and Cynthia Moss was looking at elephants. This was my inspiration for finding a place in the wild to study dolphins long term. What these three researchers really had in common is they found a place in the wild, they planted themselves there, and committed to at least a couple of decades of observations to try and understand an animal society. And that's really what I wanted to do with dolphins in the wild. I wanted to start the Wild Dolphin Project because I was really curious about what was going on in the mind of non-human animals. And at the time, Atlantic spotted dolphins were fairly unstudied and they are intelligent and complex social mammals. I chose the Bahamas as my study site because I wanted to study these animals underwater. The Bahamas has clear water, accessible dolphins, and this species has spots, which helps us determine their age classes. Dr. Herzing has been studying this specific community of Atlantic spotted dolphins for over three decades. In this video, we will cover some of what has been learned over the years. For more details about the science and discoveries made by the Wild Dolphin Project, please feel free to check out our scientific publications online or schedule a talk with us to learn more. Over the years, Dr. Herzing has learned a lot about the life history of this species. She discovered that Atlantic spotted dolphins are born without spots and gain these spots with age. As a result, she was able to split them up into four age classes. Two tones are the calves with no spots. Speckleds are the juveniles with a sprinkling of black spots on their bellies. Mottleds are young adults, and this is when we start seeing white spots form on their dorsal side. The old adults are the fused age class. They have spots that start to coalesce, and their bodies are black and white all over. Still focusing on the life history data, Dr. Herzing also found out that the females are pregnant for about a year. And through non-invasive genetics, we have discovered that the older males are the ones actually siring the offspring. Dr. Herzing and her graduate students have also explored a lot about the ecology of the Atlantic spotted dolphin. We have learned that they prefer to feed on fish such as flounder and razorfish. But more importantly, we've discovered that the spotted dolphins will actually go off the deep ledge at night to feed on flying fish and squid, something the resident bottlenose dolphins have never been observed doing. Dr. Herzing and the Wild Dolphin Project have also learned a lot about the social behavior of this species. She has found that females will often associate based on their reproductive stage. For example, groups of moms with calves will often stick together, even if these females never associated with one another prior to having calves. Lastly, one of Dr. Herzing's main focuses of study with this species has been acoustics and vocalizations. Here she will explain in some detail how we record the sounds the dolphins make and the vocalizations she has learned. My main goal was to study dolphin communication. To do this, I had to lay down a framework to understand their own society. This included knowing the individuals, their relationships with each other, and how they communicated with each other. To correlate sound and behavior, we've always used an underwater video with a hydrophone input. With many years of data collected while recording sounds with a hydrophone and simultaneously recording video, she has been able to make correlations between vocalizations and behaviors. Dolphins make three types of vocalizations. Dolphins make frequency modulated whistles, and in some cases, they have a specific whistle called a signature whistle, which is basically a name. Dolphins also make sonar clicks for echolocation. This is the sound they use primarily for navigation and hunting. Dolphins also make a sound called a burst pulse. These are the most unstudied sounds because they are hard to categorize. They are close proximity sounds and often found during aggression or play fighting.
Now that we have caught everyone up to speed with a brief recap of who we are here at the Wild Dolphin Project, let's look into the future. And the future is now. Greetings, Dolphin Nation. I'm Miles O'Brien, today in Santa Monica, California. We are live from all over the world, from Florida, from Singapore, from Georgia. Uh, the list goes on to bring you all together for our common love for wild dolphins and most importantly, the woman of the hour, the founder of the Wild Dolphin Project, Denise Herzing. Denise, it's good to be sort of together. This is our <laughs> third Wild Ocean Science event, the first time we've tried it virtually. Uh, each year we've done it, we've always raised a little more money for the, the good work that you and your team do. And that's our goal here today. We're going to learn about dolphins. We're going to learn about how you learn about dolphins. And we're going to spend a few moments supporting the cause, one way or another. But we want you to participate, help the cause, and most important, I want you to think about this as a conversation. We have uh, some people here uh, who know an awful lot about dolphins, unsurpassed knowledge, uh, frankly. And Denise, um, just a couple thoughts on, you know, last year, of course, right about this time, couldn't even contemplate a virtual event. We were right in the thick of it as far as the pandemic goes. This year, things are looking a little more up and um, the good news is I hear your season is already sold out. Every uh, voyage of this Danella uh, is fully subscribed. So that's, you have an exciting season ahead. Tell us a little bit about what you have planned. Yeah, thanks, Miles. And it's great to have you back, even though it's virtually, <laughs> but this is our life <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, we have a full season. We are going to take our many new toys out that you're going to hear about. And um, yeah, last year we got cut short completely. So yeah, we're uh, encouraging you to ask questions after every uh, section of technology and we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I think one of the questions on my mind is, do you think I'm modeled or fused at this stage of my life? I don't know. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of fused some days. <laughs> but, You're uh, fused. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll get to all those questions as uh, the uh, evening day, whatever it is, wherever you may be, uh, moves on. We want to begin with, um, you know, Denise has been spending uh, now since 1985 uh, following basically one pod of dolphins in the Bahamas. Uh, and, you know, people always say, well, how does she find them? And it, it actually a couple of years ago got difficult because uh, we think climate change caused a, a crash in the food supply. And uh, Denise went out and they were gone, right? And it was actually a real challenge trying to figure out where they went. Uh, and one of the things they do is uh, come up with new ways to sort of keep their, their, their antenna out for where the pod may be. So why don't we, without further ado, uh, we're gonna roll a video uh, with uh, Cassie Volker-Rushi, who is uh, the ABLE research assistant as part of the Wild Dolphin Project who's going to tell you about a couple of the new pieces of technology they're using to try to keep track of where the dolphins may be. Climate change is an issue for many species, and even the dolphins over in the Bahamas have been unable to escape the impacts. In 2013, 50% of our resident group from Little Bahama Bank moved over 100 miles south down to Bimini, and after reviewing oceanographic data, we decided this move was likely due to a food crash in the fish population on Little Bahama Bank. As you can see from these graphs, up on Little Bahama Bank, we saw a clear drop in chlorophyll where the dolphins normally fed. On Great Bahama Bank, although there was some variation, there was no significant change in the chlorophyll levels. Since chlorophyll is a proxy for plankton production, our conclusion is that there was a major food crash on Little Bahama Bank. The lack of food forced part of this dolphin population to find another area in which to feed, leading them to the shallow sandbanks surrounding the island of Bimini. As a result of this food crash and the displacement of 50% of the dolphin population, the Wild Dolphin Project has had to resort to new technology to help locate some of our more elusive dolphins up on Little Bahama Bank. One of the new technologies we are now implementing here at the Wild Dolphin Project is passive acoustic monitoring. Recently, we deployed some passive acoustic monitoring equipment to gather data when we are not physically in these locations. The hope is that this technology will help us find some of our more elusive individuals who remained on Little Bahama Bank after the displacement in 2013. This particular device that we are using is named an EAR. 
It's basically a lot of batteries and a computer that is programmed to go on and off at certain intervals and collect acoustic data over a period of a couple months. While securing the ear to the sea floor, we had some curious dolphins come and check out what we were doing. As you can see, we picked the perfect spot to passively listen to any dolphins swimming by. If you look on the sea floor behind the dolphins, you can see the ear that remained on the bottom until we retrieved it a few months later. Another way that the Wild Dolphin Project is trying to find some of its missing dolphins is by enlisting the help of citizens through acquiring and IDing citizen photos. All around the world, researchers today are depending on citizens to upload their photos to sites such as Fluke Books. If you go to our project's website, you will find a link for Fluke Books under the Our Research tab. This will take you to a page on our website describing the process of how Fluke Books works. It takes the photos you submit of dolphins you saw in the Bahamas, and using their spot patterns, it matches them to the dolphins in our catalog. Basically, it's facial recognition, but using spots. From this page, you can get to the Fluke Books homepage, where you can fill out a form and submit your photos. If the computer finds a match, it will notify you and let you know who you saw. We hope that the next time you are in the Bahamas and you come across any dolphins, that you remember to upload your photos here so that we can let you know which dolphins you encountered. And joining us now, along with Denise, is Cassie Volkarushi. Uh, Cassie, um, it's a big ocean. Uh, how, how big an area can a device like that cover? And ideally, how many would you like to have so you can you know, find out where these dolphins might be? Um, so ideally, we would like to have quite a few more. We have a couple of different places in our research area that we would like to put these down on the bottom. Uh, always the more the better, especially because we can't be out there 24 seven. So any device that can help us collect data every day, all day long would be absolutely perfect. So you, you have to leave them there. And obviously there's no real time telemetry underwater. And so it records a big, long two month recording. Uh, that's a little bit of a data retrieval nightmare, isn't it? How do you go about listening to two months worth of um, noises of boats and everything else in addition to dolphin noises potentially? Yeah, so we actually send the uh, data offsite. Denise, I'm drawing a blank on who we send it to. I know it's we're teamed up with uh, Dr. Mark Lammers, but I'm drawing a blank on who the site is, or the uh, people are. Yeah, his group is Oceanwide Science. Yeah, so we actually hired them to do the data analysis primarily because we needed it quick because we wanted to find our dolphins from the data. It really, you know, it's just so stunning that they would just kind of, you know, disappear on you after all those years. Uh, Catherine has a question for us, for really both of you. With the food supply going down, are there efforts to help sustain the food supply to keep the dolphins around rather than having to advance technologies to find them. Um, and this brings up a very important point about um, the Wild Dolphin Project philosophy is you're not there to really disturb nature, right? You're there to observe it. But um, is there anything we can, you know, this is obviously of concern, is there anything we can or should do for, to help these dolphins? I mean, one way is always to be, uh, to support sustain sustainable uh, fisheries. And just when you go out to restaurants, try and do your research, you know, try and make sure that they are uh, accurately cultivating the fish that they're gathered. That's always a big thing. And just doing your part and researching as best as you can. Uh, when you go out on some type of tourist boat, when you go, if they say that they're swimming with certain animals, just always make sure that they have the proper permits is a big thing and make sure that they are being sustainable, environmentally cautious when they're out there as well. So it can be anything from you, just as simple as maybe not ordering and eating a lot of fish or cutting down on the types of fish that you are eating, especially ones that maybe are declining in the, their populations out in the wild. So just kind of doing your part and being educated on the topic is very important, is also a very important step. Denise, is there any evidence, uh, you know, dolphins are smart and they're very mobile. Uh, they, they know how to find uh, their next lunch pretty well. But is there any evidence that this uh, crash in the food and, and the move that they made has had any adverse impact on the pod? Well, I mean, just the fact that they had to move 100 miles <laughs> to find fish, and now they're interacting with a local group, that causes challenges. So absolutely. And we don't know the long-term reper reproduction uh, impact, for example, but that's why we study long-term 
do you, uh, roughly how many dolphins are still uh, missing in action, so to speak? Well, uh, there were about 52 that moved south. Now more are trickling down from up north where we previously were. So, yeah, probably probably another 50 are kind of missing in action, I would say. Cassie, yeah. this, is, this is a reminder, you know, when we think of climate change, we, we focus on specific things like sea level rise and that sort of thing. But there's so, there's so many consequences to our ecosystem that, it's almost impossible to think of them all, the, all the unintended consequences of the climate change. But here's one thing, uh, a slight change in temperature in the water or maybe the salinity, we do, I, do we know why that crash occurred? But one way or another, this has a huge ripple effect on species in the oceans, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. We, what we actually saw was from uh, NOAA information that there was chlorophyll, which is at the surface of the water, actually decreased up on Little Bahama Bank. And that's a proxy for phytoplankton, which is kind of the base of the food chain. So if that crashes, all the little fish that eat that, and then the bigger fish that eat the little fish, all of that just cascades and declines. And also uh, where the chlorophyll decreased on Little Bahama Bank, we did not see that down on Great Bahama Bank, which is where Bimini is situated. And that's where they moved to. So we need to start tracking the chlorophyll levels down uh, by Bimini and hopefully they stay well enough so that the resident population and the new population that went down can continue to feed, continue to feed on those reefs. So Karen would like to know how the dolphins made this change of location. For example, would some have scouted and then tried to communicate back to the others? That's, that's an interesting question. I'm sure that's one that maybe we can't answer. What do you think? Denise, do you want to weigh in on that one or is Cassie either one of you? I, I can weigh in, Denise, if you want me yeah. to. Um, so for us, we are very non-invasive. So we do not tag the dolphins. Again, we don't feed the dolphins. We don't touch the dolphins. We try to be a fly on the wall for them. If there's a synonym for that in the water, we try to just observe as natural their behaviors as we can. So for us, unfortunately, we don't know if any scouts were sent out um, to see, but it's possible we do get movement all across the Bahamas, all the different islands, because every once in a while we'll come for one year and there's a couple of uh, fused individuals. So those are the older individuals that we have not seen before. So where were these dolphins? So we do get that immigration into our population. So we do think there's definitely some traveling going on between the islands. So Mary would like to know uh, how the dolphins fared during Hurricane Dorian. That was a particularly bad one. Dolphins, generally speaking, uh, they know how to ride on a storm, don't they? Yeah. So unfortunately, we're not over there as well when the storms are happening. <laughs> so we well, don't I'd know say exactly. fortunately. Maybe fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably more fortunate that we're not there. But um Again, we don't tag them, so we don't have locations of do they go to shallow water or do they actually go to deeper water, which might be safer for them. Um, so we don't know where they go during those storms. But when we do go back to see them, we see that they're doing pretty well. When after Dorian happened, that we actually had a relief effort that we took over to Dorian uh, for the people on the Bahamas. We gave some supplies over there and we had about a day to search for some dolphins. And we were able to find four of them in our population. And one was actually a calf. So that kind of uh, uh, said to us that they seem to be able to fight off that storm and do pretty well. Uh, in 2004, we did have uh, some big hurricanes that wiped out a pretty decent amount of the population. And for a couple of years, they were still recovering and they weren't doing their normal behaviors. So that those storms can definitely impact their population and their uh, cohesion and all that kind of stuff as well. Interesting. Shannon wants to know uh, if you guys have seen any evidence of increased immunosuppression related to climate change. Now that, that, that's a tricky one to get at the way you do your work because you, you probably have to draw some blood or something and you don't do that. Right, we don't do that. Um, the only genetic uh, or body sample that we get is um, actually their fecal samples, which we can actually tell paternity based on that. I don't know if there's some way that we can uh, decipher the Im immunosuppressants and that kind of thing. That's something we would have to look into, but it's definitely a good idea that it's something that we can possibly look into in the future. And maybe with our genetic samples, we can get even more information. But yeah, because we're non-invasive, we don't like to pull them out of the water and get any kind of blood samples because we want to keep that mutual respect and allow them to keep us watching them in the water. So yeah, as of right now, we don't have a way to see, to see that, but Again, with that genetic fecal sample, we might be able to get some information. 
All right, I have a suggestion for you, Shannon. If you really want to find out the answer on this, why don't you fund a little bit of research? Cassie's, <laughs> I think we've heard an idea here. Cassie's kind of yeah. intrigued. And, uh, you know, science costs money. So we're going to invite you to uh, pony up if you like. And, and so we'll make sure you're, um, maybe we can make you a co-author of the paper or something, or at least in the acknowledgments. Um, yeah. uh, Jeff is curious um, if we know what caused the decline in the concentration of chlorophyll on uh, Little Bahama Bank. Do, is there a, a root cause? Is it a temperature or acidification or other issues? I think it could possibly, we don't know exactly for sure, but Denise, if I remember correctly, it has something to do with the wind change that we had in that area over the summers. Yeah, that's still a real open question. We honestly don't know. Um, yeah, the wind direction has changed a lot. So that could decrease nutrients potentially. Hard to say. Again, we don't, you know, we don't even know which knobs we're turning anymore when it comes to climate change, and the consequences are difficult to predict. All right. Well, um, let's let's move on. Everybody's staying. So if you have any um, questions further that come to mind for Cassie or Denise, they're not going anywhere. Uh, but uh, I got to tell you, I you know, I've had the good fortune, um, thanks to my cousin uh, Ruth Tetzel, board member on the Wild Dolphin Project, to uh, have had a cruise on Stanella with some of these wonderful people. And uh, one of the highlights of the mission was uh, being um, with the person you're about to meet. Uh, Drew is, um, to say he has an infectious smile and demeanor is an understatement. And on top of that, I've never seen a guy, and I, I'm in the TV business, I've never seen a guy who knows GoPros better, frankly. And uh, his ability to capture... Uh, the dolphins uh, in their environment is extraordinary. And he's here to tell you a little bit about what the next piece of technology is, which is 360. So let's uh, watch Drew and then we'll bring him into the conversation. So take it away, Drew, and tell us about 360 degree viewing of dolphins. My name is Drew Mayer, and this is my video editing workstation where I sometimes edit videos for Dr. Herzing and our researchers so that they can analyze the behaviors and vocalizations after we come out of the water. Imagine for a moment that you, yourself, are a dolphin researcher. What you want to do is concentrate on behaviors. So you would point your camera here and record what looks like the activity. But then look what happens. Where do you point your camera now? What if you didn't have to point your camera at all? Now you don't have to. This is a 360 camera. It has two lenses and it's able to record in a complete circle, 360 degrees. You take this and you put it in an underwater housing and you attach it to what I call Drift Cam 360. I designed this for Dr. Herzing so that it has adjustable ballast so that at about 20 feet down it hangs in the water column and it records all the behavior of all the dolphins within visual range. You can adjust the ballast so that it can hang at 15 feet or hang at 30 feet. Releasing the Drift Cam 360 below the surface gives the researcher a near limitless range of perspective radiating from the center point of the camera, meaning that it allows for viewpoints into the dolphins' lives that we could be hard pressed to get any other way. We can track behaviors and interactions that we might otherwise have missed. Here's an example of how that works. Yeah, so I mean, when I was in there, there was a bunch of aggression going on. So squawking, head to head. So this is like a okay, big group of males. Okay, this is replaying. Yeah. So that big group of males. Yeah. So I was in the water following them. So they're kind of just traveling in this direction now. But you hear that buzzing, which isn't normally heard in aggression. Aggression is like squawks and all that kind of stuff. So that buzzing is courtship. So that's, I mean, we would just not, have, we would have heard it, but then we would have been like, why is that going on in aggression? So now with this 360, we can just go back and zoom in on these individuals and what they're doing. I wonder what else we missed. Well, <laughs> Probably we didn't. a lot. No, but we didn't because <laughs> we can go back and look. And so let's, we'll go back. The footage from Drift Cam 360 proved to be so valuable for research that I added the 360 camera to an apparatus I had designed 
which we call Manta. Here's Cassie and I discussing the benefits of it. Now, this was great. Yes. But this is really interesting. This is a 360 camera. And this is its underwater housing. And this is a happy researcher. <laughs> Once a very I do happy this. researcher. Now, Cassie, tell us what this does for you. So now we have 360 view while we're in the water with the dolphins. So again, I'm pointing at the main action with the GoPro and the high frequency. But now if there's dolphins playing behind me or doing aggression behind me, then I have the 360 which now captures that footage. Dolphin research has come a long way from underwater still film cameras and underwater writing slates. And our understanding of the dynamics of these amazing dolphin lives and their environment is advancing every step. It's exciting to see the dynamics of the whole pod, and then to go back and to look at groups of dolphins and alliances, even individual dolphins, and track them throughout the environment. That's what we have with 360 cameras. It's very exciting, and we're really looking forward to uncovering many new things that we weren't able to see before because we had a limited vision. Now we capture everything. Now here's a little treat. This is the first time that the dolphin saw a drift cam 360. Watch what happens. Hopefully I've made you as curious about 360 cameras as these dolphins seem to be. Text us your questions now and we'll do our best to answer them. That was fantastic. Joining us now live on the Wild Ocean Science Part 3 edition is the legendary Drew Mayer along with Cassie. And uh, Drew, the problem with you is you don't have enough fun in what you do. Uh, <laughs> clearly, uh, you got you got to pick up the energy level, will you? A little bit. And by the way, you could probably do late night, um, you know, uh, call in ads, you know, for products. It's really good. It's very good stuff. Makes me want to buy one. Um, so I, you know, the the question which immediately came to mind as I watched this is, if you if you attached this video. Uh, and ran this video into uh, an Oculus Rift headset or something, you could have a virtual dolphin experience. Have you tried that? And is that something that um, people could have access to do somehow? Actually, my son and I have one of those Oculus uh, headsets, and it's wonderful. It's um, if, if we could only have everyone have one, it, you'd, it's mind-blowing. 
maybe Cassie, you could weigh in on the value that they uh, give you all. So first of all, how much are they? Well, these cameras are more expensive than most of the prosumer uh, cameras. Um, they, the cameras themselves cost about $500. The housings cost like a hundred. Then you need extra batteries. Then you need um, uh, SD cards. Then you need a workstation like you saw that I have. Now that's that's a bit of a workstation. I have uh, four 4K monitors. Uh, it's pretty heavy duty. One of the things we need, and Denise, uh, you and I were talking about this just last week, is here in the lab where we are right now, we need a video workstation here. We need to have a large screen and maybe a couple of large screens, a powerful computer, because we're dealing with some pretty heavy duty data streams from two cameras inside one camera is stitching. There's all kinds of things, zooming in, zooming out. But anyway, we need power and um, that costs money. Um, and I would say to properly outfit us um, would probably cost about fifteen thousand dollars. But being the wild dolphin project we can make do with less and i would say probably with about eight thousand dollars or so we can be up and running and be able to handle some things here's the problem miles is that i'm not always here uh, i do some traveling like you do <laughs> and um i'm actually this summer going to be away for a lot of the time i'll be on two trips i think with matthias and and uh, thad i think might be on one of them um and since i'm not here all the time i can't leave uh, my equipment around. And those two cameras are my personal equipment too. Um, there's, uh, here's something that's really interesting. And Denise and I have been talking with the company that makes these 360 cameras. Now they make, and you may have seen this uh, Miles because you're in broadcast, um, they make a camera that is incredible. And the price isn't that much. It's about $5,000 and then the housing which is incredible also, is about another $8,000. This camera can do 3D, 360 in incredible resolutions. We can add hydrophones to it. Um, it it's just amazing. You can tell I get excited about this stuff, Miles, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> well, you, you, might, you might have touched on an answer to Alex's question. He wants to know if there'll be advancements made to obtain audio, better audio on the 360 camera. It sounds like integrating that with a hydrophone. And we're going to hear a little bit more about, uh, you know, triangulating audio with Matthias in a, mo in a moment. But, you know, this could have a tremendous uh, value for research if you had the ability to not only record sounds, but find out where the sounds are coming from. And in a 360 environment, it, you sort of not, you're not missing anything, right? Yes. Uh, and Alex, that's an excellent question. Um, with this super high-end unit that We'd love to get, please get it for us, uh, whoever's listening. Um, you can hook up a hydrophone to it. It's a, it's a good rig. But beyond that, we do use uh, high frequency hydrophones that we have, and we'll show that uh, hopefully in a little bit um, if we have time. Um, and just recently, Dr. Herzing, could you talk about the, um, the Ultra HD high frequency uh, unit that we just recently got? Oh, well, we have a new, yeah, it's a Tascam unit. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it's ultra high frequency, but it's more high frequency that we synchronize with our video. And yeah, you know, the ideal unit is Matthias's, who we're going to hear about, unit with 360, really. That's the ultimate there's the holy grail there. And mm -hmm. to think you started out, I mean, what were you, you were shooting tape initially, right? Back in the oh, yeah, old VHSC, wow. oh, big camera. Yeah, that, but, you yeah. know, that's science, right? Absolutely, yeah, I'd say, I'd say the resolution has increased a little bit, should we say? Um, Larry actually wants to know, uh, uh, Drew, Larry would like to know the um, make and model of the camera that you're referring to. It's made by Insta360, and it is the pro- the, the, they have two, the Pro and the Pro 2. Now, if this, this is the Larry that I think it is, uh, he makes some incredible dome footage um, and that he has around the world um, that uh, is, is just incredible. If you get a chance to go to one of his shows where he has a dome set up and he, he, he plays the 360 or the 180 video, you got to go. 
Uh, right. but, but Larry, uh, if you want to give me a call and I'd be happy to, um, to give you the, uh, you know, the contacts. So, all right. And what's Larry's last name for those of us who aren't familiar so we can find him? If it's Larry Curtis, uh, that's the guy. He has a long-term history of cinematography in underwater and with especially cetaceans. Um, he's an incredible guy. Look him up. So Liam thinks um, the Oculus and 360 video would be awesome for school presentations. It would, could really immerse the kids in the research. You can imagine this really exciting kids, you know. For those who can't afford or can't get to the Stanella, this would be a pretty cool substitute, wouldn't it? It would. It'd be fantastic if we could do that. Um, and with the advancements of technology, the prices keep coming down. Uh, the, the user uh, experience, it, it really is. Um, maybe sometime in the future we can, I don't know, we can somehow show it. But the user experience is incredible. Um, cause you're right in the center of the action. That's what's the 360 cameras put you right in the center of the action. Everywhere you look is the dolphins because quite frankly, Cassie, when, when we get in the water, sometimes we're swarmed Yeah, and we, and it's confusing. We don't even know what to look at, um, because there are dolphins swirling all around us and they're everywhere. So what this does, and especially, you know, I'll bring the Oculus in so you can look at it. Yeah, I would love to. It allows Cassie to be right in the middle of the action. Now she can see everything and she can now isolate different behaviors with different dolphins. The things we're going to learn with this is really outstanding. And like Denise said, pair something like this with Matthias's, uh, oh, and I, I have to, you know, Matthias's uh, ASPOD. It, it, it really brings us to a whole new level. And I have to uh, give props to Matthias. He's the one that actually introduced me to 360 cameras. We went mountain biking and uh, he's, he's uh, talking to me about 360 camera and he whips it out and he puts it on the handlebar of the bike that I'm, I'm loaning him. And we go for a ride and afterwards it blew my mind. And so right then I bought the latest ones they had and um yeah, I'm looking forward to collaborating with Matthias more on it. Uh, Matthias, I'm sure we'll, we'll be happy to throw a 360 on your ass pod if you don't have one on there already. So I just want to add one thing back to Liam, who chimed in with the chat. Uh, coming from, I was born in Ohio, so a landlocked state. So if we could get to students that are in landlocked states and be able to show them the marine world in some kind of virtual, the 360 Absolutely. for the dolphins, I think that would just be such an awesome experience and really connect with the kids who can't visit the ocean or have never seen it before. So I just think that's a really cool tool to bring up. And, and it's sure a lot more humane than capturing dolphins and putting them in a tank to, to show kids, right? This is to see them where they belong. Uh, all right, excellent. We, we have a few more questions, but we're going to save them to the end because we want to move it along here um, and talk a little bit. You know, that experience of being swarmed by dolphins is something I've had the good fortune to um, live through. And it's, it's hard to describe how thrilling it is. Uh, but one of the things you learn very quickly when you're in the water with these animals is uh, the acoustics are such that you really don't know where the noise is coming from. And that's it's obviously very important because Denise and her team are trying to connect behaviors with vocalizations and maybe in so doing kind of crack the code and figure out how they communicate, which would be a huge breakthrough, of course. But in order to do that, you need to sort of figure out where that where is that noise coming from? And our next uh, speaker uh, has uh, spent a ton of time doing uh, just that, coming up with the, the kind of technology that makes that possible. Uh, Matthias Hoffman Kunt is a senior research fellow at the National University of Singapore. So it's about four in the morning where he is right now. I assume he's drinking a lot of strong coffee to stay with us. We do appreciate it. Uh, he'll be with us live in just a moment. But first, let's, let's see exactly what his technology is all about. Hi, my name is Matthias Hoffmann-Kunt and I work for the National University of Singapore at the Acoustic Research Laboratory. And uh, I've been collaborating with uh, Denise and the Wild Dolphin Project for quite some years now. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about what equipment we're using and how we're using it and what's new and interesting about that. Uh, if you generally look at sound underwater, it is the main important method of communication for animals that live in the ocean. Uh, light, as you all know, doesn't travel very far, maybe maximum 50 meters if you have really, really good visibility. 
uh, but most of the time it's much less. Where sound can travel for thousands of kilometers if the frequencies are low. So a lot of animals use sound. Now for us as observers of marine mammals in the wild, uh, this is a bit tricky because our head and our hearing is not made for underwater hearing. It's made for in-air hearing. The speed of sound underwater is four and a half times faster than it is in air. Uh, so for us to distinguish where a sound is coming from is almost impossible. Um, people have of course recorded over time a lot of video behavior underwater and even with a microphone or a single hydrophone in there. Uh, but the problem really is that with one hydrophone you can't distinguish where the sound's coming from. And then people have also put in arrays of uh, hydrophones, so several four or five hydrophones or a linear array. Uh, but the problem with that is that it's not synchronized with the video. So what we have done with this device in the back here, uh, which I'll explain in a moment, is we have combined three high frequency hydrophones, uh, or up to four, and a very wide angle uh, video camera which you see up front. Uh, and it's all integrated into one system which you could then use to operate underwater uh, in there. And let me just show you the device in whole. Okay, what we have here is we've got a regular underwater housing from an old uh, Sony video camera with a dome lens up front and a wide, very wide angle 180 degree camera. And then we've got the rest of the equipment all sealed in there. And attached to this, we have three hydrophones. So one on the left, one on the right, and one on the bottom. And what that allows us is that this is all fed into the system. And what it allows us is to synchronize that with the video exactly. So for each frame, if we're hearing sounds, we know exactly where it came from. We can calculate because with two hydrophones, I can calculate an angle. With three hydrophones, I'm getting two angles, which then gives me a direction of where uh, the sound's coming from, and I can then overlay that in post-processing onto the video. So that, for the first time, really allows us to identify which animal is vocalizing at what. And so for the study of behavior, it's really important that we can identify who is vocalizing at what time, who is responding to whom. So we get this back and forth of communication between the animals. Um, so that's the system uh, in short uh, and obviously this is all fitted into an underwater housing and inside is also a, a full-size full data acquisition card, a computer, amplifiers and everything else that's necessary and you can take this whole system and swim with it underwater. So when we analyze the recorded data and we put this together then we get the following processing window. Uh, we have the main screen that shows us the video that was recorded on the camera. Uh, on the right side, we have a waterfall display that shows us the spectrogram of whatever sounds we have recorded. And the bottom, we have a time series. Uh, so what we'll, what this will do is it will process, the computer will process each individual image, each individual frame. And if there was a sound detected, it would put uh, a dot on the location of uh, that whistle. Let's watch for a second how that happens. So, here you see three dolphins, and they're all three are echolocating, coming towards us, and it's detecting the clicks of these animals. Here again, it detects the clicks of these animals. Here you go. Three animals are coming, and that's the end of that sequence. Overall, I think this is a great new tool that opens the door to a whole new way of investigating the social behavior and vocal communication of marine mammals. And maybe someday in the future we'll be able to really understand what they're talking about and then we might be able to talk to them in their language on their terms. Wow, that is so darn cool. Fantastic technology. What a breakthrough this is. Congratulations uh, on mm -hmm. your efforts there. Uh, I think this is, you know, potentially a yeah, really a, it's it's a huge breakthrough for the team to be able to, you know, see and correlate. Uh, where do you see this going from here? This this technology. Um, while well, we were talking a few moments ago about how cool it would be to integrate that with a 360 image, is there any technical reason that that couldn't happen, or is that just a matter of just applying it? 
you know, it uh, obviously it can happen. Well, part of that was simply the development of that camera. The very first one that we had in the first 360 that we tested out uh, on the bike trail with Drew uh, was it had okay resolution. But if you start zooming into smaller behaviors, of course, then it gets a little bit more fuzzy. So the problem with a 360 camera is that uh, you need to have the resolution. And so only a really, really high-end 360 can handle this. Then uh, another problem is when you're zooming in, uh, the direction calculation of the uh, of where you put the dot will change because you're not, you know, let's say you, your system is calibrated to exactly the whole view that you have on your camera, right? And now all of a sudden uh, you're zooming into something. So then then that pointing doesn't work anymore. So you need to know how much you zoom. I mean, it's all doable with software in theory, right? But you need to, that needs to be practiced and we haven't done that. So normally the system is, has a fixed lens, right? And we're not zooming in. Uh, but of course we could, you know, first do the detection and then zoom into the behavior and say, ah, okay, now that Emma was talking oh, and here this one responded. So I think, Mary, we have found yet another avenue of research that you can fund if you like, because Matthias, needs to figure out how to make this work in 360. This can be done. It's just a matter of time, but um, it, it is extraordinary. We, got, we do have a question, and this does occur to me, when you, especially when you consider 35 years of data that we're talking about. Uh, Shannon says, holy cats, that seems like so many terabytes of data, data would be generated in a very short amount of time uh, with the wolf acoustic data we capture. I guess she studies wolves it quickly becomes difficult to store and manage. And we're, we aren't even collecting video at the same time. Matthias, is the, uh, the post, as we would call it, the post-production nightmare uh, as, as, as big a deal as it sounds there? Uh, yeah, you end up with a lot of data and downloading and processing and you know, just writing the code to you know, take each video frame, look for the uh, corresponding audio and then put it back together and save it and you're running this, you know, for lots, lots of sections. So it's, it is quite time consuming and uh, does take a lot of data storage and computing processing power. So Denise, before you had the uh, technology that Matthias has helped you develop, how did you, how were you able to correlate behaviors and uh, vocalizations? Uh, was it just, you know, um, a little bit of guesswork or how would you do it? Well, you know, we would just correlate group behaviors with group sounds. That's still the problem, right? So this is technology I've been waiting for for 35 years, really. And like Matthias and I have talked, we can start asking really simple biological questions like, does a mother make a whistle and the calf joins her? Or does the calf make a whistle and the mother joins her? So you can start refining your questions to, you know, avoid the mass data overwhelming <laughs> problem, really. And that's what graduate students are for, right? Ask a specific <laughs> question. That's part of it, right? Yeah. Right. Dean would like to know, Matthias, how long it takes during post-processing to get the squares to line up with the video. Is that a big uh, crunch for a big computer? Uh, well, at the beginning it was. And now we're, we had a lot of... Uh, software overhang. So now we're trying to compress this down so that you really just take the sections that you actually want to look at and say, uh, if we had a 10 minute video or a 10 minute section that we're saying, okay, now we want to look what's happening. That would probably take, uh, well, maybe 10 hours to process somewhere around that. So before it was a lot more now, 10 minutes, it depends on the size of the video. So the higher the resolution, of course, uh, it, it becomes more data intense. We, we haven't really done really, really high resolution stuff yet, but the acoustics always, at least for the dolphins, stay the same. So we've, we're sampling at uh, 400 kilo samples per second per channel. Uh, so we're, we're getting in a lot of acoustic data on three or four hydrophones. So where does who, the, the computing horsepower you need, is that something you can use for your uh, uh, university or how do you do it? Well, actually, uh, processing we, normally when we let's say we're recording we're out in the boat we've just done some recordings then we download the data and then at night i just let it run and hopefully by the morning it spits out uh, some nice results and we can then look at it uh, sometimes we if it's short sections you can look at it right away uh for you know say 10 15 seconds or so if you just want to check what you have uh, but you, you you run it on the laptop uh, you know now 
processing powers on uh, you know laptop computers have gone so so far that you can actually do this on a on a laptop. But of course, if you're doing it on a bigger system uh, uh, and you have a, a station for this, then it goes faster. Excellent. You know, it's it's really extraordinary. It's, you know, Moore's law is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Because it, yes. it, it, <laughs> it uh, gives us the ability to do things we would couldn't even contemplate it just even a few years ago uh, with the ability to manage all this data. Um, I love the idea of uh, applying that technology somehow to a 360 image. That would be fantastic. Uh, all right, let's, uh, we got a couple other, here's another one from Alex. He wants to know if there's any ability for live streaming from the research vessel when we're in the Bahamas. It's funny you should mention that, uh, Alex. I, when I went on my voyage, I brought a, um, an Inmarsat satellite device and it, it didn't go so well, but technology is improving. And uh, I did also discover that a lot of uh, the work they do is within cell tower reach in the Bahamas. I discovered that because I got some crazy cell phone pills because it was just pinging the Bahamian cell towers all the time. But I wonder, uh, Denise and, and, and Matthias too, if, if, there's, if you guys have thought a little more about perhaps uh, engaging students or others uh, in real time while you're on this Danella at some location. Yeah, well, I mean, we've thought about it, but yeah, it's all about the technology, right? And you know what it's like. We're looking for dolphins for five hours and then we find them. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It would, it would take a lot to do it. But, you know, you could do a semi-live streaming, right, maybe at night and to show what you did. That would be probably more realistic. Absolutely. Yeah, with the right satellite connection, I think you, you could do that. But uh, technology is... It's getting better, so maybe maybe if Elon Musk uh, chips in and lets us use his Starlink uh, connection, then <laughs> I, I, if Elon Musk is a dolphin lover and he's listening right now, give us some free Starlink time, will you please? Yes. That's what we. That's what the Wild Dolphin Project needs right now. All right, let's um, let's move on. We were we've been talking about vocalizations and behaviors, correlating the two, trying to figure out what you know. The names are of the animals. The animals have distinct names. And all of this is step by step getting us closer to, you know, really a big breakthrough in understanding how they communicate with each other. Clearly something's going on there. A lot is going on. there, And we're only able to hear with our ears a certain range of it. There's a lot of stuff we can't even hear. Uh, Denise has had a, a wonderful, uh, she's had wonderful collaborations with a lot of people, including Matthias, but also with Dr. Thad Starner at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, he's a rambling wreck and, uh, and a heck of an engineer. And he's been working on a device, a submersible computer, uh, which has uh, the capability of serving as more or less a real-time translator. So let's, um, let's watch Thad's video and then we'll bring him into the conversation. So take it away, Thad. Early on, Denise and her team used a rudimentary underwater keyboard to interact with the dolphins. After about four years, we thought, well, we should probably wait till there's better technology because we're not going to go very far with this. So in 2010, I met a group of computer scientists up at Georgia Tech, Thad Starner's group, and turns out he builds wearable computers. And so it was like, well, I need a wearable underwater computer. So he grabbed the job and put some of his students on it. This is our chat box. CHAT stands for Cetacean Hearing and Augmented Telemetry. And basically what it is is a system of computers and amplifiers inside this aluminum casing. The computer is programmed with a number of artificially created whistles for different toys that dolphins might like to play with. Dolphins have a lot of natural toys, sargassum, seagrass, sea cucumbers, so we've been trying to label as many of those natural toys as we can. We use a scarf primarily because they like to drag things and they're very good at it. That's what they do with sargassum. And it's something they have to ask us for. They can't go down to the local dolphin boutique and buy a scarf. So it kind of becomes, oh, I need the human to get a scarf. Therefore, maybe I'll be motivated to communicate that word. So the way it works is we're in the water. I can push a sound, for example, scarf. This is the whistle for scarf. This headset just said scarf in English, so I know that's the sound I played. Now, if the dolphins decide to mimic this whistle, they'll mimic it. 
the computer will recognize it in pretty close to real time, and I'll hear the word scarf in my headset. Dolphins, when they greet each other, use their signature whistles, so we thought it'd be pretty cool to give ourselves a name. So that's my name, Denise. Now we also have some of their signature whistles on the computer. That's Brat. He's a little brat, and he's one of the players in the system. So we can greet him in his own name. So we thought that would be a start to uh, uh, trying to communicate with the dolphins. So the idea is to empower the dolphins to communicate back. I wanted a tool where they could access us and ask us to do things or request things from us. You have a couple researchers in the water. We're both wearing these underwater computers and you're actually modeling the communication system for the dolphins. It really requires not only good technology, but regular extended time with the same individual dolphins so that they get exposed to the system and start understanding the functionality of it. It's one thing to mimic a whistle, it's another thing to understand what the whistle can get you. The team discovered that juvenile dolphins showed the most interest in the interaction. This is an age where they're kind of away from mom. They're not full adult responsible dolphins yet. So they have a lot of play time. And so we have about a four year window with individuals when they're in that age. Three to her, please. Yeah. Research assistants from Georgia Tech join the scientists at sea to fine tune and troubleshoot the chat boxes that are built by the students at the university. Making uh, new interface devices that are user-friendly for marine biologists is kind of challenging from the beginning. So all of our hardware is custom designed. They use uh, 3D printers much of the time. We also have uh, machine shops in Georgia Tech, so they, they're able to mill the aluminum housings and then laser cut the other plastic parts. On the software side, Dolphins present a very interesting challenge because their range of vocalizations is so large in terms of frequency. So you have to sample at a very high rate in terms of audio on the computer. So it requires a very fast processing and efficient software on battery power with something that has no internet or external connectivity to the outside world. So all of your processing is on board, whereas you know typical voice recognition things like Google Now or Siri are doing some processing on the phone or the platform and then sending it off to the internet to be analyzed on a much more powerful computer. We have to do everything on the system. All right. And that was a clip, by the way, from Dolphins Breaking the Code, PBS Changing Seas, used with their permission, uh, and we thank them for that. As a matter of fact, we thank uh, PBS for being. Thank God for PBS. And joining us now to talk a little bit more about his research is Thad Starner, who is from Georgia Tech, as we said, and has worked on with Denise uh, for a long time, and who's one of the lead uh, researchers on uh, Google Glass, correct? And um, as you can see, right? And uh, Thad, um, tell us a little bit, you know, when you really start thinking about the challenges of trying to get a computer that is powerful enough to do what you need it to do in real time and, you know, sort of provide a, a translation, if you will, uh, and making it submersible. And then on top of that, have enough power to project out enough uh, acoustic, enough of an acoustic wave for the dolphin to even interpret. It's a huge challenge, isn't it? It was, it was monumental. Um, you know, when Denise first told me about this problem, I was like, oh, you know, I think we can do that. We'll take a look at it. And the first summer was horrible. Um, we killed so much equipment from just trying to make it waterproof well enough to handle the seawater. Uh, we found out that our hydrophones were not waterproof. Um, you know, we're, so we're trying to put an equivalent of a supercomputer in a box on Denise and not have it blow up while wow, she's interacting with the dolphins. And so far we've not had any major fires, uh, at least when she's been playing with them, so that's good. Uh, but it turns out the, the really the hardest thing was physics. Uh, when the Navy does this sort of work, they have these very large speakers and very powerful batteries and, and uh, transducers and amplifiers that they do. And most of the amplifiers are on deck so what we do is shrink everything down to a very small form factor and very powerful and get enough power in the water to make that, that sound go forward. And, uh, and we've recently had a breakthrough in this. This is something called chat light. 
This is the, uh, the, the modern version of the chat system you saw. Um, and I don't think you'll be able to hear this, but this can do the same. Wait, 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 I'm sorry, Thad, that you've shrunk it down to that size? Well, this is this doesn't have the recording or the recognition size. This just has the playing size. Got but, it. But inside is a custom made amplifier. We basically took the equivalent of your stereo amplifier, amped it up, pardon the pun, uh, quite a bit, and mashed it with a uh, a speaker that can work well in water, which is surprisingly hard to do, and put it in this small form factor. And now this whole thing can actually sit on Denise's wrist. Um, and it's something that she can take in on every time she's with the dolphins, as opposed to, you know, requiring one of my PhD students to be with her uh, every trip she wants to do it. So we're going from like a couple encounters uh, a year with the dolphins to something where we hope Denise can just have this continuously there and expose them to the, the whistles, the names we want to assign things like the scarves or the pieces of rope or the seaweed. Um, and so we're very excited about that. This is number five, and we had our first successful test of this thing this month. Um, and whereas, you know, the chat systems you saw on, uh, on Stanella with the niece in that video, video clip, they each cost about uh, the equivalent of a new car to make. Um, this costs about a tenth of that in parts. Um, it's still a lot of, still a lot of labor, but um, it is something where we can make a lot more of these and get them out there and have replacement ones for Denise. And, you know, it also kind of has a sort of, you know, superhero um, <laughs> Uh, uh, aesthetic, uh, aesthetic to it, and you know, since the niece is our superhero, I figure we should start giving her, you know, you know, good, good <laughs> bracelets for it, right? Totally, totally. She is possessed with superpowers. There's no question. Well, let me ask you this though: if you, if you need, you know, if the Navy, I'm sure the Navy does this for bad <laughs> reasons we don't like, but if the Navy idea is to put all the horsepower on the surface and connect it with a cable. Why not do that in this case? Or is that too much of a constraint on their efforts? Well, first of all, it constrains the, the, the researcher to the boat too much. And the dolphins really are moving around way too much. The other thing that we found out is the dolphins really do not like these tethers because they're, they're worried about being snared in it, that sort of thing. So one of the things that is our design constraint is we don't have wires floating in the water. Um, just dolphin, the dolphins will just stay away if that, if that happens. So it's wow. all got to be self-contained. And we also need to make it so that, you know, when, when Denise is, is having researchers in the water calling for a scarf, that, you know, when one researcher calls for it, they can hand it to that researcher. Then another researcher calls for it, they can hand it to that researcher. We really want to be interactive and socially modeling to the dolphins. You know, here's the name for this object, the scarf. If you want the scarf, make the whistle. And what was really um, astonishing is uh, one of our trips, um, a couple of years ago, we really did have something that looked like, you know, actually several times, where it looked like uh, the dolphins mimicking our, 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 our word for, I think it was for sargasm. Um, but the uh, thing is, it was at a, a too high a frequency for us to hear easily and also for the computer to hear. And so now we've been upping our horsepower on our computers uh, so that we can actually listen to that whistle being made at any frequency. It doesn't matter if it's in our hearing range or above. So that raises an important question. There, there's a fair amount of dolphin uh, communication, uh, uh, vocalization, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's, that is way out of our ability to hear. So how, how can researchers um, possibly get a handle on that? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I think we have a couple of slides that show some dolphin vocalizations. Can we pull up the first slide, please? One of the things we see here, I don't know if you can see the scale, um, but uh, this is only to 20 kilohertz. Oftentimes we see dolphin vocalizations going up even into the 200 kilohertz range. Um, and so it's very hard for us to um, uh, uh, analyze in the water. But what we've been doing is collecting lots of examples of dolphin vocalizations in socially meaningful scenarios from Denise's work for the past 33 years um, and looking for things that are similar. So if you look at these vocalizations here, these are three separate examples, you can start seeing some similar patterns in here. But it's very hard for us as, as humans to understand what these patterns mean or if there's even some repetition here. So what we've done is created an a, uh, artificial intelligence algorithm that looks at every little chunk compared to every other little chunk and clusters them together and says, hey, does this look like you know, the equivalent of the letter A? or the equivalent of the letter B? Does it look like something that is the, the, the same self-similarity? Uh, self so if we have the next slide, please. 
Uh, this is work by Daniel Kohlsdorf, who is, uh, uh, was my PhD student, who's now currently working with Wild Dolphin Project as a, uh, as a side gig. Um, so what we're doing is just looking at all this vocalization and figuring out little tiny features, which is what you see in the bottom left here, little tiny features that seem to be, you know, uh, uh, throughout the, the, the vocalization, throughout the spectrogram. And then we put those together into the equivalent of letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera. And that's what you see on the bottom right. Um, the uh, we're, we're clustering all the things look similar. So these are so A, B, C, D, E, F, this is up to G. Now if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, what we do from there is take any given vocalization we hear and we try to put them together, explain them in terms of the sub, sub parts. So in this case, it looks like this vocalization was, was a combination of A, I, and E. Now, of course, these are just our human labels to it. We have no idea what this means to the dolphins yet. But one of the things we can start doing, though, is look to see, are these patterns repeating? And are these patterns repeating in certain things, like when they're doing aggression or play fighting, or when you have a mother-calf reunion? Where do these patterns, are these, are these um, uh, letters, are these patterns consistent? So if I can have the next slide, if you would. Uh, what we actually look, uh, did and what Daniel did, Kohlsdorf did for his PhD dissertation is looked for a large amount of vocalizations and clustered them and saw if there was a grammar, sort of a, a language structure to this. And what we discovered, much to my surprise, is that the more strict, what's called a, a regular S expression in, in computer science, um, was the one that best explained what we were seeing. And so in other words, the dolphins really are doing st stuff that is consistent that has some sort of consistent structure to it. And now we're trying to get to the stage where we can say, hey, can we actually um, get finer and finer understanding for those meanings? Now, I'm not saying we're that far yet. What we've found is that uh, for four categories, I think it was aggression, um, play, mother calf reunion, um, and foraging, we discovered very consistent vocalizations that were common across those four classes. And now what we're trying to do is get finer and finer grain understanding of uh, if there is anything that correlates with the behavior and the vocalizations they're making. It's hard to know how close you are to a breakthrough, right? Yes. But it sort of feels like you guys are on the cusp. I mean, uh, or do you, do you not dare not say that? For we, I, I dare not say that yet. I keep, I keep on feeling, you know, it's, it's incremental. And the amount of computer power that we need to do this stuff is ridiculous. Um, I've been able to manage a sweet talk, uh, 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 my colleagues at Google, to giving us some computer time. Um, matter of fact, they've, uh, Denise is the one who's been writing the grant proposals for this, and unfortunately, I've been able to, to push them to the right people. And we have some of the best minds um, uh, at Google kind of for free, uh, giving us, looking at the data and giving us uh, some free consulting on this. Um, and so, you know, I keep on feeling we're almost there, but... Um, uh, uh, it's slow progress. I really, I'm uh, not going out last summer has, has been making me twitchy because uh, <laughs> I really want to get more data and especially on the high frequency stuff we record on the chat systems you know, and, and, and on um, uh, Matthias's uh, ASPOD system. The higher frequency stuff is really where there seems to be a lot of data that looks consistent to me, just to my eyeball and looks to me very much like the uh, analysis we were doing with uh, human phonemes uh, back in the 80s and 90s. And so when I look at some of this data, when Denise first showed me this data, I was like, oh my word, there's something cool in here. Let me at that data. And you know, 10 years later, I'm still, I want more data. <laughs> <laughs> I want higher frequency data. I want more stuff. Give me better. Give me better stuff. Let's let's see what can be done here. Um, and so, um, yeah, I the, the the thing with chat, the fact that we've gotten some mimics back, what I would actually consider mimics, looking at it, and the fact that we're getting stuff that is that is consistent with visual behavior, is very encouraging. And so I just keep on hoping my uh, crossing my fingers, and I keep on hoping to get these grants. Uh, so that Daniel and other uh, PhD students can keep on working with us. We're going to take a quick hold. We have a million questions. I have a million questions. There's some, some coming in. Dolphins do not have what we would call a language, as far as we know, correct? Correct. But with these new tools you've just heard about, we are trying to see if they have language-like structures in their acoustics. These are tools we just haven't had. So now we have them and we're exercising them, which is great. So I got to, yeah, I, somebody 
asked me this question once when I was telling him I was going to Stanella and I said, you know, they're, they're working on talking to the dolphins. And his, his response was, well, what would you say to the dolphin anyway? What? <laughs> so, so what would you say to a dolphin if you could? Um, Denise, have you thought, you must have thought about this. Oh, I ask people that all the time. I don't know. Uh, how's your day going? <laughs> What's important to you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Listen, find a non-human animal with language would be amazing. Right. Yeah, that, that'll be a moment. That'll be a moment. I want to go back to you, uh, Matthias, on, um, you know, this is not cheap stuff. Um, no. <laughs> um, what, um, if you had a million bucks, what would you make? If I had a million bucks, I would combine uh, what Chad and Denise were doing and my stuff and make it small and portable and everybody gets one and you play around with that. That's Chad, how about you? You like that idea, that kind of confluence of all those technologies into one device? That would be great. I would love that. If I could get Matthias's stuff combined with what we're trying to do um, in a small form factor, uh, that would really open up stuff. We'd have so much data to play with. Um, you know, heck, just, just getting uh, uh, Matthias and me in the same spot for a couple of months to work on the hardware together would be, you know, tremendous. We have so much fun when we're together, just coming up with yeah. new technologies. <laughs> you know, you're, you're researchers with busy portfolios. Uh, it's difficult to, to carve out time for something like this, I'm certain. So do you, do you have a, is it something you just make a priority and make time for? Yeah, well, for, for me, it's like it's now with COVID, of course, it's kind of hard to go travel, then come back, then there's two weeks of quarantine or three weeks of quarantine that you have to go through. And before that, you have to do a million COVID tests. So it's become a little bit more cumbersome than it used to be to travel that. Even then, it's 12 hours time difference. So until you adjust to being in Florida, uh, it, it always takes me a little bit. But, you know, if we've done a couple trips in back to back and, you know, uh, on some of them that was on the boat with uh, when I was there. So we had, we made good progress and then we like discussed and we have new ideas and, you know, we're, we're, we're brainstorming on what else we could do. I, I think having all of you pictured here in one place as much as possible could lead to some amazing ideas. You know, we've I've talked about what this is like being in this world of COVID, all of us doing, uh, you know, the Brady Bunch and, and uh, kind of thing. And, <laughs> a lot of good creative ideas happen when you're not in a meeting, right? It's uh, you're having a little glass of wine after a long day of diving on the dolphins, and suddenly an idea crystallizes in your head. So it'd be good to get everybody back together. And so and they're captive on the boat; they can't go anywhere. So <laughs> <laughs> I have them all to myself. <laughs> it's, it's the way you like it. Really a uh, question for Denise uh, Shannon is uh, curious about the importance of elderly animals in dolphin society. Now that you can identify age, classes, individuals, pedigrees, and who is vocalizing when, during what behaviors, what have you learned about the importance of elders in dolphin society? We're talking about the fused animals. like me. Yes, well, I think as we see in other mammals, the, they have the wisdom and the experience. Uh, yeah, they train the young ones. They know where to run to, probably during storms. Yeah, we can't... Um, can't uh you know underestimate that because that's very important jay wants to uh, jay wants to know this. oh go ahead you want to weigh in yeah, yeah i just wanted to add to that so even though denise has been out there for close to 40 years now maybe some of the animals who were fused when she first started had traveled down to bimini and checked out that site so we haven't been out there forever but that passage of information so when they moved down to bimini in 2013 because of the food crash the previous fused who were in that society years prior could have known about that site. So just that passage of, passage of information could have been very important from the older animals. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like dolphin trip advisor. They knew where to go. Where to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they knew which island to travel to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, and Jay wants to know just in general, how is the family? We haven't really kind of addressed that overall. Are they doing okay? I mean, you missed them last year, right? So do, do we... Have any data on how they're doing right now? So we did miss them last year, um, but the year before, so we had about 10 pregnant females, or sorry, 20 pregnant females the year before in 2019, 
And in 2019, we had 10 new calves. So as of 2018, going into 2019, they are very productive. Um, but as of right now, because we missed that year, we had, so sorry, going back in the 2019, we had the 20 pregnant females and we saw a couple of them and three of them had new calves. So they are still producing new calves, but I'm pretty sure we missed a decent amount of them. So we could have a lot of new little calves to look at next year and try and figure out who they belong to. Because remember, they don't have spots on their firstborn. So it's very hard to distinguish who is who. So <laughs> us researchers are going to be having quite some fun this coming up summer deciphering which calves are whose. We call them little footballs <laughs> and they usually have fetal creases. Yep. Sometimes. They're just adorable. <laughs> Oh my God, that's going to be great. You're going to have a great season. It's going to be so great to get back out of the water, I know. Well, Jay would like to know, and this is probably more uh, directed toward uh, both that and Matthias. Uh, Jay wants to know if you um, have to protect your data and technology from competitors and even the military. Uh, I, I, maybe this is somebody who saw Day of the Dolphin or something. I don't know. What do you think, Dan? Well, one of the things that uh, uh, we do is keep it under... Uh, password protection, of course, um, because for the scientists, uh, this data is, you know, what is their, their pride and joy often. This is unique data. Um, so, you know, you, you also want to make sure that anybody you collaborate with is going to be respectful of the data and what you do with it. So we are, you know, we take our cue from Denise and we only release data to whoever she says it's okay to do so uh, with. And other than that, we protect it like it's our own. And Denise, you're pretty protective of your data, as I recall. Well, you know, I think it could be really misinterpreted, too, you know, in many ways. So, yeah, but that's true of most scientists, I think. How about you, Matthias? Do you worry about that at all? Well, for, for our purpose, it depends. You know, the triangulation, uh, so it, is it the code that you're using or is it the actual data? The actual data... Um, uh, sure, you know, we, you could add this to databases, say, for vocalizations uh, that are available for people to listen to. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, the code, obviously, we keep proprietary. Uh, we, you know, we don't know what, what, what people would do with it uh, or who would claim ownership all of a sudden. And, uh, you know, it's happened before. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we're, we're protecting what we, what we have. Anne would like to know this. Why in 2013 did the project go down to Bimini? How did we know the dolphins moved there after the prey crash? How did you how did you figure that out initially, Denise? They weren't where they usually were. And we looked and looked. And then uh, a couple of dive boats mentioned they thought they saw some of the individuals down in Bimini. So we went down and there they were. Yeah, I remember that trip. I was on it. The, there were two, we had two trips in a row. And the first trip, we saw absolutely no dolphins whatsoever. For 10 days, we were just like, what the hell is going on? What, you know, what happened? And then, you know, you got that phone call saying, hey, we saw your dolphin son in Bimini. And, you know, like, what? <laughs> and then, you know, we said, okay, there's no harm. We, there's nothing here, so we'll go down to Bimini. Uh, yeah. And sure enough, there they were. <laughs> and they're even still moving around the sandbanks, actually. In 2020, for the two trips we were there, we actually saw three new dolphins from Little Bahama Bank that were now down in Bimini. So they're still moving around, still trying to figure out what's going on. And hopefully they seem to be starting to mix in with the resident group down in Bimini, but they're also still kind of choosing their own group versus the Bimini group. So that's all the new information that we can now try and figure out because we have this opportunity to study this. We can just see like, how is an immigrant population going to mix in with that resident group? We have a question here from Dean. This is a good one. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but is there any way I can get involved with the project? One way to get involved is to donate. But beyond that, Denise, what, what, should, what do you tell people? It's, you, you can, of course, participate by going out on Stenella. What, what are the other options? Uh, we have an internship program. Uh, we have local talks. We have a few volunteers occasionally. We do some Florida work as well. So depending on their location. And then, of course, if somebody is into data crunching and analysis or is good at software writing, we can always use support on developing a better interface, uh, you know, working on the code. So that's always helpful. And Melissa is reminding us, uh, Melissa, who's, you know, the, the genius behind this great production, is saying in-kind donations are welcome, too. So maybe you've got a fancy camera you want to share. 
Maybe you've got a computer. Maybe you've got an editing system. Hmm, I should think about those things. Maybe <laughs> there are some things that I could uh, share as well. Um, I think that uh, Drew, you're not. You're only going to spend uh, two voyages. That's a that's a light summer for you. It uh, is. Will the 360 camera be on board the whole time, though, or is that is that something that we need to uh, facilitate? Well, it would help if we had more because. Um, like I say, I do a lot of traveling uh, with my son or my daughter. We do some, uh, in fact, after this, I'm going to be dirt bike riding up in central Florida with my son. I'm going to be <laughs> jumping from here. Um, and I use the cameras for all of that. But of course, Dr. Herzing and Cassie have, you know, what won't I do for you, Denise? <laughs> You're the gizmo, man. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and, and one thing, if I could say, Miles, um, I've been involved in the project for about 16 years. And the dolphins, of course, are wonderful. Um, they're geniuses in the water. But you know what really does it for me is sharing time with these geniuses, Thad, Denise, Matthias, and even yourself when you were on the boat. It, it, uh, the exchange of ideas um, is, is so uh, illuminating and so much fun that I thank all of you for the time I've been able to spend with you and look forward to uh, our trips coming up. We will have another Wild Ocean Science Fall Edition coming up in the fall. Do we have a date yet? I guess we don't have a specific date. Is that right, Denise? We're still trying to figure out exactly when. Yeah, it'll be in the fall sometime. Cassie has a list of participants for us, though. Tell us who's going to be there. And it's going to be fun to uh, get a little debrief on how the season went. So tell us who, what, what we can expect in the fall. Yeah, so we actually have uh, at least four people who will be joining us in the fall. It'll be the same kind of run through as we did here today. So it'll be Dr. Cindy Elliser, who was one of Denise's PhD students in the past. It'll be Dr. Michelle Green, who is also a PhD student of Denise's. We'll also be joined by Brittany Hill, who is at the University of Colorado. She just graduated and finished with her master's. So congratulations, Brittany. She will be talking about her master's thesis in the fall. And then also we'll be joined by Leah McPherson, who is also a graduate student at the University of Hawaii, who will be talking about her drone work and kind of what she sees with us when she's out uh, with the dolphins. And Leah was on my voyage. She's quite a, quite a free diver as well. So that, that'll be, I'm looking forward to that. I, uh, I hope I get to at least watch and maybe if you invite me back, I can uh, participate as well because uh, it's, there's nothing more fun than talking to you guys. It always inspires me. Denise, give us you know, some final thoughts on, you know, here you are, 30, well, it, you know, you started when you were two years old, I know. So 30, right, yeah. 35 plus years into this work. You've had all kinds of setbacks, and I'm sure you wouldn't have predicted 35 years ago a pandemic would be one of them. But uh, the idea of doing a study like this, this longitudinal study, is kind of the Framingham Heart Study of Dolphins. See, the, the multi-generational approach has such value to science. Give, give people an idea. I mean, no one does this, right? So give us, put this in perspective vis-a-vis -vis other efforts to understand these animals. Well, there are other long-term studies of dolphins, just not underwater. Well, that's a key point. Well, <laughs> you're this, studying right? behavior, yeah. So we're lucky that way. You know, and everything we do is framed to tell the story of their lives and crack the code of their communication. So there's no other way to do it. You have to immerse yourself, right? And then tell the story, get the data. You know, your heroes, Jane Goodall and, and uh, Diane Fossey, uh, they, they had the advantage of being able to sit and breathe air and, and <laughs> notes. Uh, you, you have a much steeper challenge trying to understand these animals. And it's worth, uh, uh, I think, reminding folks that you need um, more than a notebook and a pencil to do what you need to do. Sure. But it's a privilege and the ocean's a great place to be. All right. Denise Herzing. Uh, a pioneer in uh, the study of these uh, wonderful, smart mammals. And uh, we appreciate all the work you've done and bringing together all these uh, smart minds to do what you do. Uh, Thad, Matthias, Cassie, you, and then of course, Melissa. Melissa, pop on for one second, if you would, put your camera on. We just want to, we want to Ooh, recognize you. <laughs> Melissa, you did a great job. Melissa and Fonte. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for participating. Come join us in uh, the fall, and uh, we'll give you a debrief on the season. I'm Miles O'Brien. That's the, that's the Wild Dolphin Project 18. Thank you very much for uh, listening and participating in this event. We'll see you next time. 
As we move into the future, we plan on continuing our basic dolphin monitoring with these communities. And we also will use existing and new technology to expand our learning. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the Wild Dolphin Project and our work in the Bahamas for over three decades. And we hope you'll continue supporting our organization and other organizations that do critical work in the oceans and on our planet. Thank you. If you would like to support us here at the Wild Dolphin Project, there are a few different ways in which you can. Donations are always needed and are a great way to help us out. You can also become a member, and with each membership level, there are different perks. You can also join us on a research trip where we have specific trips for interns and others for the general public. Another way you can help is just by spreading the word about who we are and what we do. And as always, please follow us on our social media sites and visit our website to keep up with what we are doing next.